welcome to this series uh, called Structure Meets Function, organized by uh, Instruct Slovakia. Uh, as you know, uh, Instruct Eric provides uh, access to various infrastructures uh, like NMR, electron microscopy, mass spectrometry, protein production, etc. It provides uh, research visits, it provides training courses, internships, and also these kind of webinars, as you will see today, organized by Slovakian part of Instruct. Today, we will have three contributions from three different institutions. The first one will be devoted to theoretical analysis of single molecule force spectroscopy. It will be given by Jacob Bauer from the Institute of Molecular Biology from the Slovak Academy of Sciences. The second one will be given, this contribution will be given by Zuzana Pakanova from Institute of Chemistry from the Slovak Academy of Sciences. And she will talk about application of mass spectrometry in, in uh, glycol protein analysis. And the third one will be given by Gabriel Zoldak from the Pavel Josef Shafari University in Košice. And he will talk about single molecule protein biophysics. And in fact, this is uh, closely related to the first talk. So I would like to start the session and I would like to ask Jacob to start his presentation. So I wish to speak about interpreting single molecule force spectroscopy experiments with normal mode analysis. Um, before I do that, I would let me briefly introduce the Institute of Molecular Biology where I work. Um, we have about 11 laboratories split amongst four departments. I work for the biochemistry and protein structure department. Um, the Institute has an interest in a number of different projects, um, including cell division and sporulation, cell transcription, protein structure, proteolysis, apoptosis, structure and function of membrane ion channels, bacteriophages, and we have a laboratory which is devoted to bees and bee products. Now, about single molecule force spectroscopy. So the idea is you take a protein of interest, you introduce a couple, a cysteine, a couple of cysteines, and you join them to two DNA handles through disulfide bridges. One of these is connected to a fixed um, surface, and the other one is attached to something that moves. It can be a polystyrene bead in an optical trap, or it can also be the probe end of a scanning of a scanning electron micro scanning atomic force mic microscope. So what you do is you then move the moving part to put to put increasing force on the protein and you see what and you observe what happens as the protein comes apart. Here's a plot from uh, from a paper from a few years ago. Uh, so on the x-axis, you have extension. As you apply greater force, you stretch the system more and more. The first part is the elastic stretching of the DNA. Then you reach a critical part where the protein comes apart. This shows up as a tear in the plot. It goes up whoop, and then continues this way. And if you relax the force, you can watch the protein refold. Now, if you look now, the unfolding part is in this area of the rip here. And if you examine it, you can see the folded form, the unfolded form. And in this experiment, which was on the nucleotide binding domain of E. coli HSP70, you can see two intermediate forms. Now, what this experiment gives is it gives Link is it gives extension lengths how long the how long the intermediate and the unfolded state happen to be. You can correlate that you can tie this to a certain number of residues using a worm-like chain model, where you can see that um, you can see that the first intermediate has a length of about 23 nanometers, which is correlated to some number of residues, and intermediate two 
has a length of 79. But you don't actually know, this doesn't give you any information as to what the structure of the intermediate looks like. One way to interpret this is to use steered molecular dynamics simulation, where you fix one in, where you fix one end and then you put the protein through a simulation and you model increasing force on the second end. As you apply force, you can say reach a state, which you can, which can be correlated with the first intermediate. And as you progress along, you can get an intermediate state that is, could be correlated with the second one. And then you reach finally the unfolded state. So this is probably the most informative way to interpret these kinds of experiments, but the but molecular dynamic simulation tends to be, take a long time to run. And it can be the limiting um, effort for any of these kinds of experiments. So after a talk at a previous INSTRUCT meeting, Dr. Joldak asked me if maybe I couldn't use normal mode analysis to try and gain some insight into the into the protein structure that might be used to help interpret these kinds of uh, these kinds of experiments. Now, normal mode analysis is a technique which can be used to calculate the dynamic properties of molecules. It has a number of other it has a number of other applications. It's a very well known technique. Its advantages in this case are that it is. Um, very computationally cheap to run. It might take a year to do a molecular dynamic simulation experiment, but I can, but normal mode analysis can be done in like five minutes, even for very large things. And for, and it does give the same kinds of experimental results. It does give the same, it does give the same kinds of information that molecular dynamic simulation can give in some cases. So it's based on the small molecule approximation. The idea is that the protein or the other system is in a minimum, either a global minimum or a local minimum. You parameterize the forces acting on it to make this differential equation, which you can solve, and you can assemble the solutions in the form of an eigenvector problem which you then solve to give you the matrix of eigenvalues, which are related to the frequency of the individual modes, and the matrix of eigenvectors, which are the, which are the individual modes themselves, and they're used to describe how exactly the atoms in the protein move with each individual mode. Of course, the first objection you might think of to applying this to um, force spectroscopy is, well, the protein isn't in an equilibrium conformation. It's got a net force on it. And that's true. We can't use it to directly model what's happening in the experiment, but we can use it to gain some insight into the structural characteristics of the protein. And these structural characteristics are what will determine how the protein comes apart in the experiment. So we can use it to gain insight, even if we can't directly model what's going on. So for an example, for an example, I will, I will talk about the application to the most commonly used, to, to the most popular um, study protein, T4 lysozyme. So here's a plot showing a molecular dynamic simulation used to interpret a force microscopy experiment, which pulled on the two separate domains, I'll show these in a minute, of T4 lysozyme. They found in their experiment, they had a native state, a transition, an intermediate state, where you could see one domain was clearly separating and coming apart, another transition, and then the denatured state. So if we, if we um, let's look a bit more closely at T4 lysozyme. So here's the wild type form. 
here are the two domains, the C-terminal domain and the N-terminal domain. What's in, one of the things that's interesting is that the in, very N-terminal end of the protein forms an alpha helix, which is structurally part of the C-terminal domain. So in the unfolding experiments, they found that they have to, that the N-terminal domain is weaker than the C-terminal domain, but they come apart more or less at the same time, although the N-terminal domain comes up, does come apart a bit sooner, and that folding and unfolding are cooperative. They decided to see what would happen if they made a circularly permuted mutant where they broke, where they removed this from the N-terminus and attached it to the C-terminus. They produced a protein which behaves very much like the wild type form, but it folds and unfolds differently. What they did find is that the cooperativity in folding is gone, and but that the N-terminus comes apart much faster, the N-terminal domain comes apart much faster. So if we want to interpret the experiment with normal mode analysis, we, should be, we will not be able to capture the folding cooperativity, but we may be able to, find, to see whether or not the N-terminal domain does in fact come apart faster in this circularly permuted mutant. Let's first look at the wild type protein. So here I've colored the N-terminal domain blue, the C-terminal domain red. Um, this brown blobs in the middle are the buried surface areas, which can tell us both how, um, both what parts of the protein are likely to move and also which parts are going to be more stable. The more stable the domain generally, the larger the buried surface area. Um, so you can see that the circularly permuted mutant does have a somewhat less, somewhat less dense in terminal domain. So the experiments that we're trying, in the experiment we're trying to describe, they attached the DNA tethers to residues 16 and 59 and directly pulled these two domains in different directions. So first we calculate the normal modes. Here are the first 10. And next, we choose those modes in which, since we're trying to model the experiment, since we're trying to interpret the experiment, we choose those modes which pull the domains in opposite directions. Um, to help interpret, to help find, with, you can do this by looking at the motions. To make it a little easier, you can also look at, you can also align the protein along one of the coordinate axes so that the principal directions that you're pulling the protein in in the experiment line up with one of line up with one of the principal coordinate axes. And when you do this, you can see um, say that the um, in terminal domain in mode six say is all on one side and the C and the C-terminal domain is all on the other side. So with the help of these plots, we can do that, and we can select those modes which pull proteins in opposite directions. So now once we have the normal modes, what we can do is we can use them to um, computationally distort the structure with a given amplitude. So if I want to get an idea of what, um, of how the structure would be distorted if I were to amplify the modes that pull the two domains in opposite directions, I can choose a suitably large amplitude and the modes that separate the domains and I can calculate a distorted structure. So at a moderate amplitude, you can see that the domain, both in and C terminal domains still have most of their shape, although the gap is a bit bigger. If I increase the amplitude to something that's probably physically unreasonable, I get a physically unreasonable structure, but I do see that the N-terminal domain has come apart before the C-terminal domain. But you can still see some internal structure here. If I do the same analysis to the circularly permuted mutant, I find that at the moderate amplitude, I get a 
At moderate amplitude distortion, the N-terminal domain has come apart almost completely. There is not too much structure left to it. And at, 150, and at an 150 amplitude, then it's come apart completely and just looks like a mess. So in this, for this system, in this ex, um, trying to interpret these experiments, I see that the that normal mode analysis lets me say that the circularly permuted mutant does, the N-terminal domain does in fact come apart a lot faster than it does for the wild type. And here's N. You end at the same at the same relative amplitude, the N-terminal domain for the wild type is still more or less intact, but it is not in this state for the circularly permuted mutant. So I did this, I also did this for a number of other structures, um, which I don't have, um, which I probably don't have time to talk about now. So I'll just, so to, and just to summarize, normal mode analysis can be a useful and computational inexpensive way to model protein dy dynamics. And it could substitute for molecular dynamic simulation in interpreting the results of single molecule force spectroscopy, especially for proteins which have two or more domains. You can do, it will also work for single domain proteins, but only under very particular conditions. It does not work very well, it does not generally work for them very well. So it may or may not be appropriate for interpreting experiments on small single domain proteins. Okay, so um, acknowledgements for the Institute of Molecular Biology. I would like to thank Vladina Baurova and Eva Kutyova, who is my supervisor. I did this at the instigation of Gabriel Sholdak. Um, uh, our research generally is, in, um, is supported by an interreg grant from the European Union, an APVB grant and a VEGA grant. And what I've talked about here is, we, is described in a paper which is submitted to nanomaterials and it's presently under revision and should come out sometime this year. And so thank you for your attention. If you, I can take any questions and I can expand on anything you might like to me to expand upon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Jacob, I'm wondering whether when you choose different amplitudes, whether you don't force the protein to adopt a certain conformation. You know, if you change the amplitude from say 60 to 120 or 150, whether you, when you are choosing the lower numbers of these amplitudes, whether you just do not limit this possibility to adopt uh, different conformations? Um, what uh, the normal modes will describe how the protein, um, the direction the protein will move in, but they provide no information at all as to how far a given mode will move. So the amplitude is, uh, pure, is purely arbitrary. Um, small amplitudes will cause it to shift only a small amount, and larger amplitudes will cause it to push out a large amount. It's just a number for generating the distorted structure. I could have, I would, I wanted to, the, they're not actually quantitative. The point here was to see if I force a shift of this much, it has this effect on the structure, and if I force a shift of a greater amount, it will have a greater amount of, it will have a greater amount on the structure. Okay, so this is basically on the experiences of, of the person. It's, who... it's not really quant, it's not really quantitative. Okay, okay. There's, this is simply a feature of the way that you can, of the way you can use this particular, the one particular um, normal mode analysis package to distort structures. There's another one which does not let you specify the amplitude of the displacement, but instead allows you to specify a range, an RS, RMSD range for what you, for how widely divergent you want the final structures to be. Okay. 
uh, can you say choose another method like molecular dynamics and compare the data to, you know i don't i'm wondering whether if you choose a smaller protein for example to be to be feasible and when you compare data from uh, i mean not normal mode and dynamics whether you are getting uh, I mean, not not dynamics. Of course, you cannot get the same data, but at least the three D structure whether is comparable. Then, well, no, you can't. Um, you can't. I, you can't use this technique to duplicate um, the steered molecular dynamics that I showed back in slide um, five. So you. Can't you can't use it to replicate that because it's studying a static structure. If you really want to systematically and in a physically reasonable way distort the structure, you have to do molecular dynamics. The point of doing it this way is to see if you can't gain the same kinds of insights. In this case, the same kinds of insights are, are um, which domain will come apart first? And is it more or less, and is the domain more or less stable in the, between the two different mutants? In the case of T4 lysozyme, in the case of T4 lysozyme, the, um, while the CP13 domain is less structurally stable than it is in the case of the wild type. That's about all you can say. Um, the structures that come out of this kind of distortion are not physically reasonable in the sense that you can use them, you can, you can say, this is what it looks like. You can use it to say, this is probably what's happening. You use a less computationally demanding um, approach and you get correspondingly less I don't want to say exact in this case, but you get less detail as to what might be going on. You can get the big idea, but you can't necessarily get the detail back. In some cases, you can get more detail. In some cases, you can't get more detail. OK, thank you. We can move to the second talk. Uh, then, Susanna, please, if you can start your, your presentation. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to present uh, something about the application of mass spectrometry in a glycoproteomic analysis. Uh, my name is Zuzana Pakanova. Uh, I am from the Institute of Chemistry, Slovak Academy of Sciences. Uh, at our institute, we study glycans or saccharides and their conjugates uh, I think since 1953, so it's a lot of research. And now we would like to tell something about the glycoproteomic analysis. So briefly, what is the glycosylation? Uh, the glycosylation of proteins, it's important to mention, to mention that uh, on contrary to transcription or translation, glycosylation is non-template process. It's also essential, it's dynamic, so it depends on the current status of individual in human. Um, Glycosylation aids to protein folding, secretion, transport. It uh, determines its function, and it has also some uh, regulatory roles, such as activation of some secondary pathways as well. Uh, for example, uh, differences in glycan structures can change the way how the antibody elicits a response when it's binding to the antigen. And glycosylation also affects uh, as I already told you, uh, affects function of proteins, their activity, clearance, solubility, recognition, and some other features. Uh, there are two main um, glycosylation patterns that we can observe in uh, proteins. The first one is O-glycosylation, when the glycan is attached to serine or treonine. Or the second one is N-glycosylation when the glycans are attached to asparagine in proteins. It's important to mention then the knowledge of glycosylation is crucial for biopharmac 
pharmacological products, for example, when you produce some therapeutic antibodies or enzymes or other recombinant proteins that are expressed by host that is different from the primary origin of protein. Uh, for example, when you, um, when you uh, uh, X prime your protein in yeast and it needs to be a human protein, the glycosylation should be similar to human. So the main methods we work with in our lab are based on four different approaches. The first approach is the determination, determination of intact glycoprotein mass by simple Maldi-Toff methodology. Uh, then important method in glycoproteomics is analysis of released glycans. This includes uh, sample derivatization uh, because we need to uh, increase um, signal intensities in spectra. We have to avoid some in-source fragmentation. So the sample derivatization is uh, often crucial. Uh, then the important method to mention is analysis of glycopeptides and the identification of glycosylation sites and calculating their occupancy uh, by proteomic analysis of heavy atom labeled peptides. Uh, this is performed by, not by Moldy, but uh, by um, combination of nanoliquid chromatography with uh, tandem MS. So our spectrometers we work with are Maldi Ultrafrac Stream and the Orbitrep Elite uh, Electrospray mass spectrometer. So let's start with the first approach, uh, intact glycoprotein mass by Maldi Tov. Uh, this is an example, a very nice example uh, from the study of recombinant human cytomegalovirus uh, glycoprotein. So it's a human herpes virus. In the upper blue spectra, you can see the intact glycoprotein, how it looks like. So uh, the first signal is around 14 kilodaltons, and you can see seven same mass shifts, each around uh, 1038 daltons. After the protein deglycosylation, we have observed only the first 14 kilodaltons peak. Uh, so from this analysis, we can conclude that uh, these 14 kilodaltons is the intact protein and it's occupied by, or seven glycosylation sites are occupied by the same glycan. Uh, as you can see down there on the right side, we have uh, released and glycans, isolated them and analyzed. So uh, you can see this approximately uh, 1039 was uh, three manoses, two N-acetylhexosamines and one core fucose. Uh, this was uh, made with a collaboration with the Institute of Virology at the Biomedical Center in Slovak Academy of Sciences. So the second approach is analysis of released glycans by Maldi Toftov. Uh, just briefly, I would like to mention our uh, experimental workflow. So we can start this glycoprofiling uh, with protein, serum, cells, or some isolated biomarkers, whatever. At first, we have to denature them, reduce and alkylate. So we need the glycoproteins to be unfolded to sterically enable the deglycosylation. Uh, so for this approach, we use enzymatic release of n glycans. So there is a commercially available uh, PNGase F peptide and glycosidase F enzyme. There are some alternatives such as chemical derivatives, uh, chemical uh, glycans glycan release, but uh, we have good experience with this enzymatic approach. So after the deglycosylation, we have released n glycans, but of course in complex mixture with the rest of protein or with the serum. So we have to isolate them. Uh, for this purpose, we use a non-porous graphitized carbon solid phase extraction. So we will get rid of everything else and we will isolate the free n glycans. And as I already mentioned, we have to uh, increase the signal intensities in mass spectra and uh, avoid in-source fragmentation that happens in mass spectrometry many times. So uh, for this, we have uh, optimized the strategy of permethylation. 
And then the last step is multi tof tof analysis. Um, this is an example. Uh, it's a uh, from a recently published paper. Uh, you can see the neutral fraction of uh, N glycans from serum uh, glycoproteins. We all have them. Um, the upper spectrum is uh, from negative control serum, and the lower spectrum was for from um, patient with suspected uh, disorder of glycosylation. So when you compare the spectra of uh, patient and negative control, uh, you can see the signals at uh, 2192 or uh, 2396 are uh, significantly or dramatically uh, decreased. So based on this data, uh, we have concluded that the, the step of adding uh, uh, one manose was um, disrupted. And this step in the glycosylation pathway is uh, catalyzed by alpha manosyl transferase 8. Later, we have uh, confirmed this with the genetic analysis. So we have observed a new homogeneous mutation that was not described before. And it's also amazing to mention that only 16 patients worldwide uh, were described uh, with the mutation in this uh, step of glycosylation. So it's really a rare disease, but uh, you can clearly see where the pathway was disrupted. Another approach, uh, what I would like to mention, is the identification of glycosylation sites by proteomic analysis. Um, each glycopeptide consists of, uh, of course, glycan part and the peptide part. The glycan is uh, attached via asparagine, as I already mentioned. And when you use this enzymatic uh, deglycosylation uh, in water, this uh, will release the glycan and the asparagine will convert to aspartic acid residue. Um, this is uh, called the deamidation. And uh, in normal water, you can see the mass shift of around uh, one Dalton. But when you use a heavily labeled 18O uh, water, the mass shift will be three Daltons. So this is really a um, big mass shift, easy to observe. And it also allows us to distinguish between a spontaneous the uh, glycosylation that happens and uh, the glycosylation uh, by uh, PNGase F that we added. So for this uh, approach, then we analyze these uh, glycopeptides or peptides or deglycosylated peptides with the nano LC orbit red mass spectrometry. Uh, we have some softwares how to um, uh, annotate this data. And uh, we have a nice example from our recent collaboration with uh, Dr. Bonaroxi Di Patti from Italy. Uh, so in this case, we analyzed the recombinant ceruloplasmin uh, protein. And from this analysis, uh, we have observed that three out of seven theoretical glycosylation sites were occupied, 38, 86, or 69%. So here you can see the table. At first, of course, each glycosylation site should be covered by peptides, not the peptides that are bearing glycosylation site, but the uh, peptides in general. Sometimes it happens that signals are overlapping. So for example, this 2208, uh, uh, we haven't observed. Um, then we can calculate uh, the percent of glycosylation at each glycosylation site, as you can see here. So this calculation is based on the ratio of uh, heavily labeled um, aspartic acid to asparagine after PNGASF treatment. Um, instead of uh, deglycosylation with heavily labeled water, we can also analyze intact glycopeptides. Uh, for this purpose, uh, enrichment of glycopeptides is crucial because we don't want uh, to overlap signals. And uh, that's why we usually use uh, helic. It means uh, hydrophilic interactions, liquid chromatography-based uh, solid phase extraction. 
So after this enrichment of glycopeptides, uh, we just analyze them by Malditov uh, mass spectrometry. Sometimes we can also connect these to uh, liquid chromatography separation. And we also work a lot uh, in nano uh, flow rates because it's like uh, microliters per minute. So it's a, a small sample amount we can analyze. Uh, for example, a mass or a signal at 3344 is a glycopeptide. And uh, in this spectrum, you can clearly see um, intact glycopeptide mass that is 3344. And it, of course, consists of peptide backbone. And then you can calculate the glycan that is attached. So this is also uh, glycopeptides from ceruloplasmin, and uh, we were able to observe all three glycosylation sites in their uh, intact status as well. And the uh, last thing I would like to share is uh, application of mass spectrometry of glycans and their conjugates also in other fields. Uh, for example, this is our uh, recent paper uh, made in collaboration with the uh, Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Natural Sciences here in Slovakia. So we have analyzed the um, galactan precursor in mycobacteria. It's uh, in their cell, cell wall. And in this study, they did a genetic knockdown on, of uh, the transmembrane subunit of ABC transporter that resulted in accumulation of aberrantly long galactan precursor. So you can see the mass of this precursor was uh, around uh, almost 10 kilodaltons. So it's a huge saccharide observed. So to, to conclude, uh, I would like to say that glycosylation is really crucial post or co-translational modification of proteins. It affects a lot of their features and the combination of various mass spectrometry based approaches can offer uh, comprehensive information about their structures. And uh, in the future, we would like to uh, establish, uh, optimize, and develop some methods to analyze the large intact proteins that are not 10 or 14 kilodaltons, but uh, even higher masses. But uh, in this area, the resolution is poor. So we have to work with some data deconvolution strategies. So let's see. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone in our laboratory of glycomics and proteomics. And uh, thank you, Milos Ritsovini, for the opportunity to present this work. And thank you all for uh, your attention. Thank you again for, for this presentation. And I, uh, I would start with a question. Uh, how do you explain uh, so long galactan, like 10 kilodalton, is attached to the protein? Do you have any explanation why so long chain is attached to that? Oh, thank you for your question. So this was a part of a really comprehensive study uh, when they did some uh, genetic knockdown. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, really familiar with these uh, genetic uh, techniques. Uh, so for us, it was uh, just an analysis in the collaboration. Mm, maybe uh, we can talk about this later because I'm not sure about the whole uh, principle why it happens. Maybe these uh, colleagues that they, they are working in the field of molecular biology can tell us more. So sorry, I'm not absolutely sure. Oh, of course, um, I'm, this is a question just maybe not for you, but for other colleagues of, of your, in your team. Okay, because it's not typical, I just want, because 10 kilodalton is a really huge, huge sugar, I mean, polysaccharide. So I would expect some, uh, the, Ditrisaccharide, something oligosaccharide in general, but 10, 10 kilodalton saccharide is really a, a long chain. Uh, Matt has a question. I work on a viral surface glycoprotein, and we are interested in comparing the glycan profile and occupancy of many strains of the virus. Do you think the techniques you describe have potential for a high throughput type application like this? 
Obviously, there must be a concern due to the highly involved sample preparation protocols. So thank you for your question. Um, yes, I think this is a good strategy. Uh, we usually work in 96 well uh, formats, so it doesn't take so much time or um, chemicals or anything. Uh, I think, yeah, it's a great approach that could be used for your uh, analysis or your question. I see the question uh, from yeah. Eva. Yeah. So you talked about glycosylation. Do you also use this for O glycosylation? So for this, uh, uh, I think the enzymatic O deglycosylation is really uh, hard. Uh, I think up to this date, we don't have any efficient enzyme to uh, release O glycans when they are sialylated. So for this approach, we use um, chemical the glycosylation, as I already mentioned. So uh, yes, it's possible. And uh, we are working with this approach as well, but we still have to optimize something. But uh, it's a very good strategy to use. Just we have to uh, release the O-glycan chemically instead of enzymatically. And then the protocol is the same. Okay, there is also a question from Julian. Can you see it? So if these te techniques can be used also for describing the glycan profile of other glycosylated macromolecules, such as liposaccharide molecules in uh, bacterial cell walls. So um, <clears throat> to answer this question, it's important to know how this uh, glycan or saccharide is attached to the cell wall, but there are protocols to release glycans from lipids, uh, from cell membranes, uh, from cell walls. Uh, I think it, it should be good uh, because, for example, what we did in mycobacteria, it was just a mild hydrolysis. It released the glycan and then it was uh, collected and uh, isolated by simple gel filtration. So. Uh, I think it's good to uh, know the linkage, how the oligosaccharide is attached, and then uh, it's possible to, to find the right protocol for you. Thank again, Susanna, for a nice presentation. And we can go forward to the talk number three. Thank you. By, by Gabriel. And uh, so, Gabriel, please start your presentation. Miloš, thank you very much for inviting me and, have, and having a chance to introduce research we are doing here in Košice. So just very brief idea where we are. And uh, so Košice is the second largest city in the east of Slovakia. And in the city, there is a, this building and on the eighth floor, uh, my group have uh, had labs and we are sitting there and doing uh, research. So I'm talking about development of single molecular protein biophysics, but uh, just briefly how, uh, how this, everything was established. So I prepare one slide to summarize uh, our short history. So basically I, I came to Slovakia in 2017, quite late uh, to the Center for Eastern Interdisciplinary Biosciences, which was established uh, a few years before. And this uh, Center for Interdisciplinary Biosciences is quite, I would say, unique in Slovakia in the way that uh, uh, this center was, uh, was a transition from, from the EU project called CELIM, funded by European Union. And this project turned to be, uh, turned to be, turned to, uh, be very successful and, uh, was, uh, uh, and was able to attract a lot of uh, scientists and, uh, and core researchers. And these researchers decided to move from university or from the faculty and create own uh, physical infrastructure. So we turned from the project, from the grant, we uh, transformed into into physical infrastructure, and so the the and so uh, so it was quite quite a successful story. So successful that the university uh, gave us an opportunity to create technology and innovation park, which has now more than forty employees, and we have a four innovation centers, technology transfer office, and in this technology and innovation park, uh, we have two startups and three spin-off companies. So based on this uh, technology innovation park, uh, the idea was to support the east of Slovakia more in a way that uh, can be very uh, for a very very long term 
Uh, so uh, the idea of, is at the moment to create so-called Kasovia New Industry Cluster, which combines university, uh, universities, hospital, Slovak Academy of Science, uh, some companies, and city Košice and self-governing region of Košice. So the, at the moment in Košice, we are trying to establish a high innovative top level infrastructure, uh, research infrastructure in combination with, uh, with, uh, with uh, companies and in combination with, uh, with the city. So uh, that's the future we hope for. Let's see whether we will be successful. So about myself, so uh, I'm, I'm a researcher at the Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Biosciences. I came back in 2017 and established my own group. Uh, this was uh, quite a long process. At the beginning, it was uh, I, I had three labs, and and uh, it was needed to to establish and to approve uh, 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 formally this lab. So at the moment, I have I have uh, two successful approved labs, and other uh, labs are uh, are approval is pending. In these labs, uh, I would like to establish the single molecule for spectroscopy Jacob told about. At the moment, uh, I'm at the level that's still pending uh, for, I'm waiting for, for approval. So today I will not report, uh, report uh, my uh, force or mechanical uh, uh, studies, but I will report about the, the some kind of uh, basic biophysical characterization of the protein system I choose. So the system I'm interested in is, uh, is uh, a human uh, pathological light chains, IgGs. So everybody in, um, probably knows that, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, light chain and heavy chains combine together to form, to form uh, antibodies. In some cases, uh, in some uh, chromosomal aberrations, chromosomal uh, dysfunction, gene uh, dysfunction, uh, the light chains are Overproduced and are not, and uh, they and they cannot form uh, productive antibodies, but they just accumulate in as a free light chains in the serum, and uh, at very high concentration they circulate in the blood system and uh, they can form extracellular deposits in in in, uh, in liver or heart or kidney. So they they form aggregates or casts different different uh, different uh, super molecular structures. So uh, what does it mean the high concentration? I just uh, uh, put it here a table from clinical study where you can see here, for example. So in one patient, high concentration of free light chains means that this protein can accumulate in the serum at, con at concentration 33 grams uh, per liter, which is really, really high. And of course, such high concentration has serious consequences on the bloodstream and of, of course on the physical fitness of the patient and so on. So uh, it was, it is interesting that, uh, that uh, a light chain uh, uh, regulation can be upregulated so high. And for me, it was also kind of, uh, kind of indication that this system has, uh, has a very, uh, very interesting features that are not, uh, not uh, typical for other proteins. At the same time, the accumulation in the liver, heart, and kidney may involve there is kind of mechanical or force-induced mechanism how this how this antibody uh, how this light chain light chain aggregates. So, I uh, uh, I decided to took one a particular uh, uh, light chain a pathological light chain from 50 years male patient uh, suffering multiple myeloma. Uh, in my lab, we were able to prepare. A, and successfully fold uh, recombinant form. So we did not extract from the native tissues, but we just uh, prepare recombinantly in, in, uh, in a bacterial in, eco, in a bacterial expression system. And uh, in this protein, we characterize as, uh, as a monomer and dimer, which is in equilibrium. And this protein, the structure can be shown here. Interesting in this structure is that the dimer form is uh, is in some cases stabilized by this disulfide bridge at the C terminus. So you see here this disulfide bridge, which is uh, which connects the two subunits. We found that this is not uh, happening with 100% efficiency. Even though we try different expression uh, systems, expressions and strategies, uh, we find that this disulfide bridge is not always present, which was also when we go back to the literature, we found is also found in, in a, in a, in a sample from the patients that, uh, that the monomer dimer equilibria occurred also for native proteins. So when we look at the 
protein and, and the heat for a while. You can see aggregates. These aggregates uh, can be seen here as a white blobs and white, uh, white uh, structures, large structures, which can be stained by tire, tire flowing under confocal microscopy. And you see this, this, uh, this roughly the shape of this, this uh, 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 aggregates. Uh, the aggregation of a light chain is triggered by uh, regions which are called aggregation prone. So we, uh, so we use Tango and other uh, analysis as well to calculate the tendency for aggregation. And when you calculate this tendency for aggregation, you see there are some, uh, in this case, one, two, three, four regions which, are, which tend to be aggregation prone. But at the same time, if you calculate from the native state uh, accessibility, whether these sites are accessible to the solvent, you see that uh, these sites are Usually, for example, this highly uh, aggregation prone uh, region is not accessible to solvent, which means that uh, in, under native conditions, this protein is not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, had not, uh, has not this, uh, this aggregation prone region uh, exposed, uh, and which means that it uh, doesn't aggregate through these regions, but it may aggregate through the other, other region. So we use uh, absorbent spectroscopy to characterize the aggregation kinetics. So here you see the dependence of the, the aggregation kinetics and, and you see also the uh, dependence of uh, thermal stability of, uh, of, uh, of the proteins. For, so uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, study is just to show that in, in the case of uh, thermal stability, the, there's no concentration dependence, which means that the thermal denaturation doesn't involve changes in the uh, number of molecular species involved, while the aggregation alone is highly uh, concentration dependent. And the, from the slope of this uh, dependence, you can calculate the number of uh, molecular species involved, which is two. So there are two at least uh, molecular species uh, needed to, to form aggregates. And this is also the rate limiting step in the, in the reaction. So this is the concentration dependence. So the protein uh, under native condition doesn't aggregate, but aggregate only under unfolded conditions, which in combination with the previous analysis indicates that this aggregation prone region needs to be exposed. So this is the first, uh, uh, the first analysis. The second analysis is the temperature dependence because the reaction occur very slowly. So actually several months or more, several months uh, under, under native, under 37 degrees of physiological conditions, while at the, uh, at the uh, higher temperature is much uh, faster. So we use kind of accelerated uh, study of uh, these processes. And we found that, again, the, the, the thermal denaturation is highly temperature dependent while the aggregation does not. So we can use this kind of information about these processes, about the temperature and concentration de uh, dependence to model the aggregation process as a kind of uh, empirical reaction or reaction which proceeds in two steps. First is unfolding, the second is aggregation controlled by, uh, by this uh, second order uh, rate constant. And from the set of ordinary differential equations, we can calculate the amount of uh, soluble form at uh, 37 degrees. So what you can see here is um, uh, are different concentrations of, of protein at 37 degrees. And as you can see, this number of soluble form, of course, by the highest concentration, so here, about the highest concentration uh, decreases rapidly while at the lower concentration. So the, the red uh, here uh, is uh, nearly uh, the amount of the soluble form doesn't change for a very long, uh, for a very long time. So this actually was a kind of first, uh, first uh, characterization of this aggregation of reaction. So first we, we did not, uh, did not use any perturbation unless the only, only the temperature just to check uh, whether we can model this uh, this system, this reaction. From, from the analysis, we can conclude that the, the reaction proceeds in two steps. So first is the uh, conformational unfolding, which goes through the large energy barrier. And then is the second step, which is aggregation, which goes through the much smaller barrier. So basically, when we can conclude that the Thermal, uh, thermally induced aggregation of light chain is controlled primarily by the by the conformational unfolding energy barrier. So there is also other way how to uh, how you can induce the aggregation at room temperature already, and this is when you disrupt the disulfide bridges. So I mentioned there are uh, several disulfide bridge, uh, bridges in the uh, light chain protein, and if you reduce them, then you see uh, uh, aggregation. You can measure it by uh, absorbance at 340 nanometers, and this uh, 
plot here shows just the this reproducibility of the of the measurement and it's quite high for the protein uh, and you can measure reproducibly uh, aggregation under different conditions so uh, this reduction of the TCEP, we found it can be well described by so-called Finkevatsky model, which uh, describes also two, which consists of two steps. First is the nucleation, uh, so rate constant, which uh, uh, which uh, describes nuclear forming of the nucleus, and then the fiber formation when the when the mo native monomers are added and form fibrils, long structures. That's, uh, that can be uh, uh, performed or analyzed at different protein concentration as shown here. So we have a protein concentration. The more protein you have, the more the, the more it aggregates and the faster it aggregates, the lag phase, uh, the lag phase is shorter. And when you analyze this, uh, this data by Finkevatsky model, you will find that the nucleation is independent of the uh, protein concentration while the fiber growth is highly dependent on protein concentration, but in the other way you would expect. So the fiber grow, grow actually decreases when you increase the total concentration of, um, of uh, uh, human uh, pathological light chain. This is our interpretation and our uh, analysis by the model uh, is due to, due, to, uh, due to the fact that this monomer doesn't exist as a, as a, as a, as a monomer only state but a monomer is in equilibrium with a native dimer so you increase the protein concentration you shift the, the equilibrium toward dimeric form which deplete you monomer form which which appears to be important for 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 uh, for fibril growth so when you have a high protein concentration it paradoxically uh, uh, stops or de decelerate uh, the fibril growth so this uh, uh, figure just show our our first attempt so uh, uh, to to characterize structure and morphology of uh, these aggregates. Of course, we we are interested in the structure of uh, of aggregates and and how it uh, relates to the native structure and so on. So we started to work with uh, with these aggregates. In our workflow, we used centrifugation as as a way how to how to separate uh, separate these aggregates, and we find out that this centrifugation is quite perturbative technique. So without the uh, centrifugation, you see uh, large clusters and large aggregates. When you apply centrifugation forces, you see that these centrifugation forces are quite uh, uh, quite strong and enough to disrupt uh, the, uh, the structure of these aggregates. So uh, when you quantify the number of the aggregates versus relative centrifugal forces, you clearly see that the, the number of aggregates increases. So this Fragments of uh, uh, of uh, aggregates of light chain can form the the nucleation, nucleation sites and can can uh, can speed up the reaction. Therefore, it was clear that for our structural characterization, we have to choose something very mild and something that uh, that can be that is not so disruptive. Uh, we had a good luck with a with a with a collaboration with uh, with Aberior. So we uh, we had the chance to 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 collaborate with Jan Vavra from a company Aberior, and they uh, lent us a, a super resolution a microscope Steadicon for for a couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, the super resolution microscope here is the principle very briefly. You, uh, you it's like similar like like a confocal microscopy, but you increase the the your 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 resolution by applying donut like shell. Uh, shape of the the beams, and in, here you increase uh, the resolution by factor of, of four by applying the depletion of the, of, uh, the emission in this in this uh, spot. So, uh, what does it mean? So, instead of this typical, let's say, 200 nanometer diffraction limit, now you can see structures below 50 nanometers, and uh, by uh, by applying this that confocal combination, we were able to. To, to detect and to visualize uh, visualize the uh, these aggregates under very very mild uh, without mechanical stress uh, conditions, and from the stacking of uh, using the Z Z stack of the microscope uh, uh, microscope uh, slides, we are able to obtain uh, 3D models. And what you can see here, you can already see there is a this individual substructure nuclei 
that form these uh, long, long uh, fibrils. Of course, this, uh, this is uh, still uh, limiting in resolution. So uh, we are very happy that the, that the Instruct Eric is, uh, is uh, providing the opportunity to apply for, for top uh, uh, infrastructures like cryo-electron microscopy. And we would like in near future uh, uh, apply for uh, apply for uh, uh, for maybe for, for some experiments to to inc to enhance structural resolution of our three D models. Good, and mm, that's all. So uh, uh, I would like to say thank you, Jacob, for 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 many discussions about the topic. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot present uh, some uh, nice data from uh, from uh, force spectroscopy, but I believe that uh, once we are done with all this administration, we uh, we will have a chance to to see nice data with human light chains and maybe to uh, uh, to analyze uh, the structure perturbation of the of uh, pathological light chains. What parts are important? What are less important? Uh, my funding is, uh, is our, my group is supported by several funding. So especially we have some structural funds. We have uh, luckily also APVV project and we have one Horizon 2020 uh, research project. So that's all from my side. I hope it was uh, interesting for you. And if you have a question, please ask. Thank you, Gabriel, for a very interesting contribution. You you saw there are about three orders differences in the rate of aggregation depending on, on conditions. There was a temperature dependence or only, or there are there are some other factors that influence influence this aggregation. Mm -hmm. So in a, uh, uh, there are quite many factors. Uh, we started with the with the primary uh, ones which we think is uh, are good, manageable, and able to measure. There are, of course, some uh, I would say also some small molecule, uh, small molecule ligands. Eventually, also there are discussion about the uh, glycans and uh, sugars that uh, they can, of course, uh, sp uh, speed up or affect uh, uh, nucleation of uh, of uh, this uh, of these light chains. Uh, temperature and, and concentration are, I would say, are basic variables, which are which are for us something that we fundamentally, uh, I think, can understand very well, and we can also quantify uh, in in a way that we can turn into a physical model of of the aggregation. So when we started uh, with uh, with the investigation on on light chain, there was of course a question. Uh, yeah, we can do it at room temperature. Or whether we can uh, whether we can accelerate the process at some point. So that's uh, that was the first uh, like like our idea. So well, why not to use this accelerated temperature study at the first place uh, to 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 observe to obs to to observe the reaction at a reasonable time. Um, so the pH is dependent is a, is a strong dependence on the pH. We choose. We are still at physiological conditions. Of course, there, there is a discussion about what are the extracellular uh, surface effects at all. We, at the moment, we don't have answer why there is a selective accumulation, for example, in the heart or in the kidney or in the liver, why these uh, uh, organs are affected and the others not so. So it might be there are some tissue specific, uh, maybe uh, proteins or, or some uh, lipids or something that we, at the moment, we don't know, or know why. But, or it might be also, as I, as I mentioned, it might be because uh, these these organs are also quite uh, under flow, under under some some uh, pressure. So maybe there is some force activating mechanism behind. So that's that's what we'd like to address in our next endeavor. Okay, so it's pretty complex problem then to to Ooh. analyze. Yeah, and counter ions. Can you can you? There is any effect? Do you think there is effect of counter ions present yeah. in? So we have a, we we did the uh, salt dependency of our different ions, and what we see is uh, is uh, when we are talking about the, the physiological concentration of salt, so like not going too much high, not to, not uh, in, in into Hofmeister's uh, salt uh, Hofmeister uh, range. So below the Hofmeister range, we see uh, some uh, some uh, effects, but they are quite. I would say mild. They are not so dramatic dependence. We see uh, that the protein is more stable, 
and uh, which is of course because it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, electrostatically unbalanced under under uh, physiological conditions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, there is one. Uh, yeah. Why uh, why is nucleation of monomers to give aggregates independent of protein concentration? I think that in this uh, this nucleation rate we still uh, uh, see uh, seeing other uh, rate limiting step. So this one or, or description as a single rate constant is not particularly correct. I would say it still, uh, for example, depends on the on the concentration of uh, a reducing agent. So it appears that in our in our system, the first nucleation rate is not is not depending on um, on the it's not rate limited in the uh, the, the uh, in the forming of nucleation, but rather it's limited by the reducing of the disulfide bridges, which uh, which then uh, is uh, the slowest uh, process and hence um, protein concentration doesn't play a role. Thank you again, Gabriel, and thank all, again all got three contributors. Thanks, Jacob and Susanna as well. Uh, we can finish this session, and I would like to invite you to the next meeting. Next meeting will be on November 16 and will be organized by Instruct Lithuania. And we will see two contributions, two talks, one on biomembranes and another on bacterial immunity. So quite, really quite interesting uh, fields. So I look forward to seeing these contributions and look forward to to the next uh, Instruct Eric webinar in November. Okay, thank you and bye bye.